Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another uh, uh, lecture in the series of uh, uh, lecture series in Baha'i studies of the Department of uh, Middle Eastern History at the Haifa University. Uh, as a coordinator of uh, this uh, uh, this series, I wish to thank the head of the Ezri Center, which is uh, myself. <laughs> for, for allowing us to use this uh, venue, which is actually one of the most modern ones or most uh, furnished ones, so it's very, very popular, <laughs> very in demand. Uh, our lecturer today is Dr. Uh, Michael Karberg, who is an associate professor in the Department of Communications at Western Washington University, where he has been teaching full time since 1997. <clears throat> he earned a PhD in Communication Studies from Simon Fraser University uh, at Vancouver, uh, Canada in 2000. His interdisciplinary research interests lie at the intersection between the study of communication, culture and conflict. He also links these interests to an active program of scholarship in the field of Baha'i studies. In 2004, Dr. Carver published a book entitled Beyond the Culture of Contest, from Adversarialism to Mutualism in an Age of Interdependence. Lots of isms. <laughs> he has also published over a dozen peer-reviewed journal articles on themes ranging from uh, identity and global citizenship to the structural critique of Western liberal democracy to an exploration of the paradox of protest in a culture of contest. For the past several years, Dr. Carver has been serving as the chair of the executive committee of the Association <coughs> for Baha'i Studies in North America. He is currently uh, on a research sabbatical working on a book regarding the Baha'i response to persecution in Iran, which he plans to publish under the title Constructive uh, Resilience. Uh, Dr. Uh, Carver uh, uh, lived in Haifa through 1987 and 98 while he was working at the Baha'i World Center. Dr. Carver's uh, lecture, or the, the, the title of which is uh, Governance, Democracy and Social Change, a Baha'i Perspective. The floor is yours. Okay. Well, it's good to be back uh, in Israel and in Haifa. I know when I was here 20 years ago, there was not a lecture series on Baha'i studies at this university. So it's nice to see the interest that the academic community is taking in the Baha'i world. And uh, thank you for your invitation, Dr. Shafar. Our pleasure. So the, the subjects I want to talk about tonight, governance, democracy, and social change, each of them is a substantial topic that could be a course of study in its own right. But I want to treat them all, uh, to kind of trace the broad outlines of Baha'i thought and practice in those three areas and show the interrelationships between them, which is why I want to kind of bring them together because it's easy to look at them in isolation. So I will just kind of touch on and introduce a range of sort of what I understand to be key elements of Baha'i thought and practice in these areas in my presentation. And each of those elements I elaborate further uh, in a paper that I've written for this occasion. And I'll leave a few copies of those with uh, Dr. Shavar. I'll also send the electronic file to you so yes, you. if other people want to access it, they can. So anything I, I touch on tonight, if, if our question discussion period doesn't answer those questions, it may be answered in the paper. And the footnotes in the paper will lead you to still further references that you know, allow you to pursue you know, even more depth. So let me jump in. Uh, I assume most of you know that the Baha'i Faith has no clergy no ecclesiastical order of any kind. We organize our affairs really through a system of democratic governance, uh, what Baha'is refer to as our administrative order. And that's what I'll start by kind of sketching the outlines of that. The Baha'i administrative order, broadly speaking, has two different arms. There's an elected arm and an appointed arm each of which I'll describe in a little bit of detail. But first, 
The entire system rests on an institution that Baha'is refer to as the Covenant of Baha'u'llah. And it's very under, important to understand a little bit about what that means in order to understand the system of governance itself. The covenant for Baha'is refers to an agreement that all Baha'is enter into when they embrace this faith. And uh, in essence, it's an agreement regarding where the center of authority lies after the passing of the founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah. So after Baha'u'llah's passing, he appointed in writing his eldest son, Abdul Baha, as the center of guidance and authority for the community. Abdul Baha, in turn, appointed his eldest grandson, Shoghi Effendi, as the center of authority for the Baha'i community. And following the passing of Shoghi Effendi, the Baha'is elected the Universal House of Justice in conformity with the guidance of Shoghi Effendi, Abdul Baha, and Baha'u'llah. Uh, which is now the permanent center of guidance and authority. So this unbroken line of authority has ensured the unity of the Baha'i community for over 150 years and will into the future, we expect. But most relevant to, to what I'm saying tonight, every aspect of Baha'i governance, the system Baha'is are building, derives from the explicit writings of Baha'u'llah or one of the three successive covenantal sources of authority. So that's the bedrock institution, you might say, that Baha'i governance rests on. So let me start then with the elected arm of Baha'i governance. Baha'is have elected institutions that function at the local, national, and international levels. At the local level, we have what we currently refer to as local spiritual assemblies. And there are, at this time, elected local assemblies in about 10,000 localities all around the world. Each local assembly consists of nine members, and their function is essentially you know, to govern the affairs of the Baha'i community in their locality. Now, uh, I want to point out that the, of these 10,000 elected assemblies that, that currently exist, their capacity varies widely. Some of them, in all honesty, are barely able to hold a single meeting in a given year and figure out you know, whose home it's going to be in. Others meet occasionally and struggle to administer the affairs of small, growing communities. But some local assemblies meet frequently and very efficiently and administer and guide you know, the activities of, of large, complex, growing communities. So there's, there's a continuum of capacity on these institutions right now. It's also worth pointing out that in many countries, such as Iran, which I know some of you are interested in your studies, in many countries the Baha'i administrative system has provided the first experience with participatory democratic self-governance in those countries. So that's the local level. At the national level, Baha'is elect what we currently refer to as national spiritual assemblies. Again, there are nine members on each. And there are currently 179 national assemblies elected in countries and territories around the world. Some are not even a decade old. Uh, for instance, most of the former uh, states of the Soviet Union have only recently formed national assemblies. Latvia and Lithuania are the youngest, having been elected in 1999. Some of them stretch back almost a century, such as uh, in the United States and Canada. Um, and some have yet to be formed. I mean, there are many countries without national assemblies as a result of legal and other prohibitions uh, on the faith in various countries, largely in parts of the Middle East and some parts of the Far East. And it's also worth noting in some countries, such as Iran, previously formed national assemblies have been forcibly disbanded. And in that case, its members executed on several occasions 
So again, there's a wide range of experience, a sort of continuum, continuum uh, in terms of where these assemblies are at. Some are just learning to function, have minimal resources at their disposal, uh, and sometimes operate in the face of external suspicion and hostility. Others uh, manage large complex communities with uh, remarkable efficiency. Then there's the international governing body, which most of you, I'm sure, uh, recognize its seat here in Haifa, the Universal House of Justice. It's uh, resided here. It was first elected in 1963 and has resided always in Haifa. And it serves as the ultimate source, source of guidance and authority for the Baha'i community. So those, broadly speaking, are the elected institutions. There's much more detail we can fill in. And my paper does a little more of that. Maybe you'll have questions afterwards I can answer. But I want to turn to the appointed institutions. The most significant appointed institution of the administrative order actually is an institution called the Guardianship, which is what Shoghi Effendi occupied as the center uh, of covenantal authority from 1921 until 1957, at which time he passed away. During that period, which preceded the election of the Universal House of Justice, the Guardian was the you know, governing institution for the entire Baha'i world. And also during that period, uh, the Guardian uh, is, uh, interpreted and elaborated many of the forms, the form and functions, really, of the Baha'i administrative system that we're now building. So Shoghi Effendi, the Guardian, left a permanent trace on the functioning of the Baha'i administrative order. Another appointed institution that actually no longer exists but that's important to be aware of is the institution referred to by Baha'is as the hands of the cause of God. These were individuals that were appointed first by Baha'u'llah, then by Abdul Baha, and then by Shoghi Effendi, whose purpose was to assist and support the propagation and protection of the early Baha'i community. Uh, they had no legislative, executive, or judicial authority and neither were they, were they a clergy of any form. They exerted their influence in more subtle ways, through the power of example and encouragement, uh, through the offering of advice and inspiration, and through the accumulation of learning and the sharing of that with the Baha'i community. <clears throat> now, after the House of Justice was elected, they created an institution to carry on some of those functions of the hands of the cause. That institution is known as the institution of the counselors. It was formed in 1968. It still exists and will continue to exist for many years to come. These are individuals appointed by the House of Justice whose responsibilities include, for instance, providing analysis, recommendations, and advice to elected Baha'i institutions. So they have a very close relationship here, the appointed arm and the elected arm. The responsibilities include fostering the growth and development of Baha'i communities, stimulating the spiritual, intellectual, and social life of Baha'is around the world, and assisting Baha'is to carry out systematic plans of action. The institution is structured in this way. Nine members are appointed to what we call the International Teaching Center, which also resides in Haifa. If you're driving up Golom Avenue, <laughs> you're looking at the seat of the House of Justice on the left, and the International Teaching Center, the seat of that institution on the right. These nine members uh, function really as a corporate body that provides information and analysis directly to the House of Justice. They also support and guide the activities of <coughs> members of the institution of the counselors around the world. There are 81 uh, counselor members who serve on, the, on continental boards of counselors in every part of the world. And those uh, members in turn have an appointed auxiliary board of right now 990 auxiliary board members that kind of support and assist in their work. 
So that's a, just a quick, broad sketch of kind of the, the elected and appointed arms of a Baha'i administration, which from the outside, I know many people find a little confusing or don't kind of fully understand. Against that backdrop now, let me say a few words first about the exercise of power and authority in the Baha'i community, because it's quite unique, the understanding actually even of the concept of power and authority. Within this Baha'i administrative system, all authority to govern, to make decisions and execute them or enforce them is invested in the elected institutions. Appointed individuals have no such authority. And even the individuals who are elected to serve on those elected institutions have no individual authority within the Baha'i community. Authority flows only when those institutions function as a corporate body and make decisions as a collective. Another interesting feature of these elected institutions, which is quite different than any other Western liberal democracy, for instance, is that the executive, legislative, and judicial functions are integrated in those elected institutions. Now, I know this tends to kind of raise eyebrows among people who have studied Western political philosophy and so forth and understand that one of the reasons those uh, three functions is often separated out is uh, as a sort of check and balance on abuses of power. And you know, Baha'is recognize the remarkable historical accomplishment of Western liberal democracy and, and the way that those uh, functions have served on a check against the worst abuses of power. But Baha'is also believe that the challenges facing humanity in this day require a much higher level of coordination than any existing system of government permits. But those checks and balances on power also, in other ways, serve to undermine coordinated governance. So uh, abuses of power in the Baha'i community are prevented in other ways. One of the ways that, that those abuses are prevented is through the institution of the covenant that I referred to earlier. And that's, a, again, a whole kind of field of study in itself. I'm not going to go into it. It's worth studying, but outside the scope of this paper. Another way that abuses of power are prevented is through the removal of any power or authority from any individuals in the Baha'i community. I already referred to that also. Again, there's more to be said, but I'll just uh, kind of flag that point for now. But there are two other ways that I do want to elaborate on by which power and authority are, uh, their abuse is, is prevented. And those are the Baha'i electoral system and the Baha'i decision-making process. So I'll touch on each of those in turn. Uh, Baha'is have a unique electoral system that is democratic but entirely nonpartisan. And even more fundamentally, it's entirely non-competitive. This tends to be a hard thing for people, at least in my country, and I think in most Western countries, to understand. How can you have democracy without competitive elections? Well, in fact, I would argue that through the Western sort of experience of democracy, we've actually confused and conflated partisan competition with democracy. And the, the Baha'i system disaggregates those. So this is how it works. At the local level, all adult community members come together once a year. Every member has a responsibility to vote, a duty to serve if voted for. So sort of the twin duties of citizenship, you might say. And every adult member is eligible to be voted for. <coughs> So there's no nominations, no campaigning. All forms of, of you know, soliciting votes are prohibited. Voters are guided only by their own conscience. And in a prayerful atmosphere, through secret ballot, they write down the names, nine names of those individuals in their community who they believe have the spiritual qualities and the mature experience 
to serve the community. They also, in voting, keep in mind the diversity of the elected body in order to maximize that diversity. And through that simple process, all the votes are added up. Those nine members who are named the most times are essentially tapped on the shoulder and asked to serve the community, whether they want to or not. <laughs> And generally speaking, I can tell you this is not something that's sought out because it's, uh, it truly is. It's not a pathway to privilege or power. It's a call to service and sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of one's time and energy, often a sacrifice of one's career aspirations that a person never sought and agrees to only because it's a condition of citizenship, so to speak, within the community. So it's a very different way of thinking about public service. Now, elections of that nature occur annually on the local level and on the national level, which is yet another way by which, you know, to kind of ease the concerns of, of Western political theorists, by which abuses of power and authority can be prevented because elected bodies are replaced annually. Other ways that... Uh, you know that this, uh, the prevention of these sorts of abuses occurs, as I've already referred to, is when individuals aren't seeking through a competitive process to have these positions, then they're much less vulnerable to be influenced by you know, external uh, players who want to influence the outcome through you know, campaign financing and a whole range of other familiar patterns that we're all aware of by which the electorate can influence uh, the outcomes of their processes. So it occurs on an annual basis locally and nationally, but in large local communities, a two-stage process of the same election is used because the communities are too large reasonably for everyone <coughs> to know one another and, and uh, make informed decisions. So. In those cases, community will be divided into smaller manageable units, and each of those units will elect a delegate. Those delegates will then elect to the same process I just described, the local assembly. That's the same process that occurs on the national level as well. The election of delegates near the local level, the delegates then elect their national assemblies. But even at that level, the delegates are not confined to voting only for other delegates all adult members of the community are eligible to be voted for. Um, which is, in, in many ways, one could say, truly democratic, because it's true freedom of choice in casting ballots, right? Then a three-staged version of the same process occurs with the election of the Universal House of Justice. Local delegates are elected. Those delegates elect their national assembly. And then those elected National Assembly members in turn serve as delegates to elect the Universal House of Justice. And that occurs once every five years. And in fact, there's an election, international convention for the election of the House of Justice coming up this spring, right in Haifa here. So you'll probably see lots of Baha'is from all over the world milling around uh, beyond the normal flow of Baha'i pilgrims from around the world. Now, in practice, Baha'is are still learning to apply these you know, electoral principles and ideals. And sometimes egoism does exert itself. Sometimes uh, voters don't pay adequate attention maybe to the qualities or the diversity of those they're voting for. But even at this early developmental stage in the Baha'i community, the Baha'is really provide a laboratory a self-conscious experiment that is testing the limits of human governance, in this case, you know, electoral processes. And much can be learned from the experience of the Baha'i community. So that's the electoral system. Let me talk briefly about the decision-making process Baha'is use. And once these bodies are elected, how do they work together? Well. Decision-making among Baha'is is guided by a set of consultative principles 
that are intended to be unifying rather than divisive. So the adversarial debate, the partisan debate we might be familiar with, associating with democratic governance, is quite different than the, than the model Baha'is use. Baha'i principles of consultation include, for instance, striving to enter the process without preconceived ideas and platforms, regarding diversity as an asset, and soliciting the perspectives of others. Striving to transcend one's own ego, one's own interests, one's own perspectives in the process. Making an effort to express oneself with care and moderation. Raising the context of decision making to the level of spiritual principle, or what some might call ethical principle, <coughs> rather than sort of pure political pragmatism. And then finally, working for a consensus but settling for a majority when a consensus is impossible. Another interesting feature of the Baha'i decision-making process on these elected assemblies is that it's quite well shielded from kind of external manipulation through various forms of lobbying and other you know, kind of interest group efforts uh, to direct outcomes in their interests. And it's done in a couple of ways. First, again, because nobody's seeking election, <laughs> And frankly, nobody's interested in re-election. Individuals are not as vulnerable, if at all, to the, the kind of external manipulations. They're not depending on other people for cash, for their campaign financing. They're not dependent on favorable media coverage. They're not dependent on all of the forces that tend to influence and sometimes corrupt decision making in other institutions. And the second member, I have also a reason, actually, that the external manipulation is minimized, if not eliminated, uh, is again that the decision making is made through what I like to sort of think of as a sort of calculus of spiritual principles. You know, if an issue is being decided, the, pr the, the principles are first clarified, and then decisions are sought within the sort of parameters of the relevant principles, rather than in accordance with the demands or expectations of of constituents and competing interest groups. So it's a very different process. Now again, in practice, <laughs> the Baha'i mastery of this process varies widely. Okay, It's, it's a very developmental uh, thing that we see in the Baha'i community. You know, ego sometimes asserts itself. Some people are, find it more difficult than others to really detach from their own ideas. And, and, and opinions and so forth. Despite those challenges, again at this early stage, uh, the Baha'i decision-making process provides a glimpse into another aspect of this experiment in government, in governance that Baha'is are undertaking that's kind of pressing the frontiers <laughs> of human governance really. The last kind of uh, institution, you might say, of Baha'i administration I want to touch on quickly is uh, a monthly community gathering that Baha'u'llah instituted in which the entire Baha'i community gets together in order to consult about its affairs and interact with its assembly. And it's a process through which every mem member of the community can and does learn the skills of consultation and, you know, sort of engagement in the electoral and decision-making processes of the community. Again, in practice, it sometimes falls short of ideals. But if you, uh, you know, observe communities that are really starting to master the subtle dynamics of this institution, you'll find remarkable insights into sort of grassroots democratic participation. So these are some of the basic elements of, of Baha'i administration. And I have a few other thoughts and comments I can share, but I want to check in actually first with our time, kind of get a sense of. Would the five, five plus five would be okay for you? Sure. Perfect. So let me you know, quickly mention a few other things and hopefully I'll have time for a few questions. First, this Baha'i administrative order, Baha'is are not building it merely for our own internal purposes. 
Baha'is believe that really the systems of governance that exist around the world today are starting to fail under the stresses and pressures of global interdependence. And that, so, so what Baha'is really are developing is a prescription for humanity. Now, that may sound like a bold assertion. And when people step back and look at this system of global governance and recognize that the Baha'is see this as a system of governance for humanity, that could raise some alarms. <laughs> Right? So here is why it's important to talk, I think, about governance and social change in the same process. The Baha'i model of social change has to be understood, to really understand how this system of governments might ever come about in a, in a broad way. This model I just described is not something that Baha'is can or will impose upon others. It can only be you know, uh, expanded through the voluntary embrace of the people of the world. That is the model of social change in a nutshell. You know, for Baha'is, unity is both the end and the means of social change. And so our approaches are fundamentally non-adversarial, non-coercive, and they don't involve proselytizing through either enticements or other you know, forms of coercion. This system only works when it's embraced voluntarily. And in fact, the covenant, which I referred to earlier, the covenant itself ensures the voluntary nature of the system. Because to try to impose it on other people is actually to abrogate the institution of the government, the, of the covenant, which is what holds the whole system together. And without that, it can't continue to function. So Baha'is pursue this entirely non-adversarial approach to social change, the voluntary processes of growth. And we pursue this even in the face of you know, hostile and violent opposition or oppression. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the fact that, for instance, in the land of its birth, Iran, the Baha'i community has faced uh, violent oppression for over 150 years now. Throughout all of that time, Baha'is have maintained a principled, unifying, non-adversarial approach to social change, to the expansion of the Baha'i community, to the construction of its administrative order, and to the social and economic development, both of the Baha'i community and of the population around it. There's much more to be said about this. And there's more in the paper, and I've written more elsewhere. If, you know, if you're interested, it's footnoted in the paper. But I bring this up merely to kind of uh, you know, point to this, the implications of this system of governance, that it's a staggering uh, process that Baha'is are involved with, staggering in its implications for humanity, as Baha'is understand it, that should raise questions, should raise concerns. And once one studies more deeply the Baha'i approach to implementing then this vision of Baha'u'llah, I think one's concerns can be uh, allayed that this system will only exist if it's voluntarily embraced. And it will only continue to exist as long as it's voluntarily embraced. So <clears throat> I think I'll, I'll, I'll you know, close on that note, because I'd like to have some more kind of interactivity. Um, and I'll just close with a comment that really that I've mentioned already. The Baha'i community, as I understand it, and, and as a community understand itself, as the House of Justice writes, for instance, about the Baha'i community, is a social laboratory, a vast global experiment that really is trying to push the limits of how human beings relate to one another, how they organize their affairs, and how they govern one another. And it's a remarkable experiment that is, in many ways, uh, 
you know, its headquarters is right here in Haifa. And I know you've all become increasingly interested in looking at that experiment and seeing what it means. And so, uh, you know, I just end with a, to kind of further extend that invitation to, to kind of avail yourself of what, whatever can be learned, which Baha'is are happy to share with others. And I'll stop talking there and be happy to have comments or questions, which I may or may not be able to answer. I'll try my best, if there are any. Thank you very much, Michael, for <coughs> very well constructed uh, and uh, <laughs> lecture. Uh, you outlined very clearly the uh, the main aspects of. Uh, uh, elections and the institution of the Baha'i World Center and the Baha'i religion. Uh, I was just thinking uh, while you were uh, describing this, uh, I would say, kind of utopic. It's not uh, actually utopic because you're actually practicing it, but mm -hmm. utopic in outside the Baha'i world. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know how far it is from what's going to be tomorrow in Iran, for example, for the parliamentary elections, which is you know, always vetting these candidates and all this yeah. uh, other things that is going to be how far that is from uh, your reality. Mm -hmm. So, any any questions, please? Yes, please. I can that uh, is. I would like to ask you in which Arabic country the Baha'i uh, uh, sect have uh, activity? Arabic country. Yeah, I understand the question. There are Baha'is in most Arabic countries. I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm not an expert in you know the kind of internal workings of the Baha'i communities in the Arab world, and I'm a little reluctant even to kind of share what little I do know because it's a very precarious position the Baha'is are in in, in many parts of the world. So uh, I will say, I mean, for instance, in Egypt, which is maybe one of the most well known and widely understood. Okay, so the Baha'is have had a functioning Baha'i community there since the time of Baha'u'llah. And they continue to struggle. Right now, there's uh, important cases before the courts related to the human rights of both Baha'is and many other groups in Egypt. Um, so there are a lot of struggles. And, and that's what I can maybe say right now. If, if there, people have more specific questions about that, I would really have to refer those actually to the, you know, the House of Justice here in Haifa because of the delicate nature of the Baha'i community in many of those countries. And I'm sorry I can't say much more. For, for your, uh, I would say, a r remark that because of uh, Islam doesn't recognize any prophet coming after uh, Muhammad, then their situation in all Muslim and Arab countries are quite precarious and you know, difficult. It is okay to say. Yeah, that's accurate. Yes, uh, Professor Gilbar, please. Thank you very much for the illuminating uh, presentation. Uh, personally, I learned a lot from it in the web structure. Uh, my question refers, or like maybe could it elaborate a little bit. Uh, first, what do you mean by the term? social change, and then my question will come, because I then together maybe we'll discuss what some of uh, theorists, uh, sociology theorists and <coughs> science uh, have said about social change, and the almost by necessity, conflict is embedded in it. I mean, mm -hmm. you don't have social change without conflict. It is part, and it goes both its for Marx and post Marx even Weber. So first, maybe I, I don't really understand what, what you mean by, by social change. And then uh, it would be interesting to see how, how can we really, how is it being, in a way, eliminated? How is conflict being eliminated yeah, from that yeah, process? Yeah. Sure. If you have social change, if you have the dynamics of social change, then how come, I mean, each community, group of people, even if they have the really the best intention in the world, if you have change, change by definition brings conflict, some sort of conflict. So how is it being handled? The change can be growth. It can be evolution. It can be a lot of things. It does not necessarily be conflict. Okay. 
So I, I, what I, I refer to not the practice, but to what we had in, in, in theory, mm -hmm. in little uh, <coughs> theory, certainly, <coughs> mm -hmm. and in sociology. And yeah. We take all you know, the giants of, of, of political science as theory. You want from uh, Socrates and, and further till yeah, Marx, Weber, Eisenstadt. Well, I sure. mean, social change, by definition, leads at some point to some sort <coughs> of conflict. Because, because it means change. Some people lose, Oppose some, it, some earn, some, yes. some, some are better off, some are less off. So the kind of the, the dynamic of change, I mean, it's, uh, it's basic. I mean, you, 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 you learn it first year of political science. Yeah? So, yeah. And I understand it does not exist in Baha'i communities. Mm -hmm. and there is a miracle. So what is a miracle? Tell us that. Well, I'll share some of my thoughts on this. And I've written elsewhere about this topic. In this paper, actually, I elaborate more than what I've said just now to you, because there was not enough time while we're here together. And by the way, I accept that there is no tension. Mm -hmm. But I don't. Uh, sure. I take it for, for granted. But the question is, how? And you, you mentioned it, but uh, in passing, and if you can elaborate, how is it being? Sure. So there are a number of ways. But the simplest way I've, I've learned to describe the Baha'i model of social change, and these are my words, these are not you know, the words of covenantal primary texts, but I understand the Baha'i model of change in these terms, that it's about three things. One is construction. It's purely constructive. In other words, Baha'is are not interested in tearing down old systems that don't work. There are many oppressive systems in the world Baha'is are acutely aware of, and we suffer from oppressions from those, along with most of humanity. But Baha'is are not interested in tearing down oppressive systems. We're interested in building up new systems that are based on justice and that are sustainable. So first, it's a constructive approach. All of our energies are into building the new. Second, it's about attraction. So in other words, if we live in a world characterized by institutions that are either unjust or maybe just imperfect, depending on which institutions we're looking at, then people know that. The masses of humanity understand those injustices and those imperfections. But if you can, in the middle of that, construct a system that does work, that is just, and that is sustainable, and if you can show that it works, demonstrate its practicality, then what you can do is attract people to it. So I talk about first construction and then attraction as two elements of a Baha'i strategy of social change. And you can see neither of those are adversarial. And the third thing I, I think is in terms of is attrition. And let me say what I mean. This is. Uh, this is sort of what happens to those other institutions that are not just, that are imperfect. Uh, a lot of social theorists, sociologists and others, think about social institutions as games. You know, games have rules, social institutions have rules, right? So social institution is like a game. And the, the institution only works if everyone agrees to play by the rules, to some extent. Right? I mean, if you, if you reject the rules, you opt out of the game. You, you're part of a different game. But if you want to be part of that institution, you, you agree to the rules. You play the game. So what Baha'is really are doing is we're looking around at all the games that everyone else is playing. And we're saying, or not us, Baha'u'llah said, <laughs> these games are not working. The games of our past, of our collective childhood, are not adequate to the needs of our future. And Baha'u'llah brought a new game with new rules. And he invited others to come and join that game. And others did. Some people did. Very few at first. But they started playing by those rules. And their experience attracted others. And their experience attracted others. From the time Baha'u'llah passed away, 150 years, that game, the Baha'i experience, has grown now to be a true microcosm of humanity in every country in the world. So. In the long run, now I'm talking about centuries now, Baha'is anticipate that 
as we construct institutions that work, now, and you all have to be the judge, you know, maybe in your opinion our institutions don't work, that's a, a fair opinion, but assuming our institutions work, and assuming they attract more and more people over time, so they grow. Well, what happens to the old games? The old games eventually vanish through attrition, through people leaving them, leaving one game to participate in another. None of that process, the process of the constru con construction, attraction, and attrition, involve conflict. None of them are adversarial, at least insofar as the Baha'i role. Now, it is fair to say, one could say they might invite conflict in the sense that other people might feel threatened by this new game and want to attack it. Yeah, but this is from the outside. But that's from the outside. And so in that sense, the social theorist you're referring to, all of which I agree, I mean, focus on conflict, in that sense, their analysis is valid this process can invite conflict, can invite opposition from the outside. In Iran, we see a lot of that, but other places too. And Baha'is anticipate more of that actually in, in other countries of the world in the future as, this, the, as the game gets bigger and bigger. <laughs> more and more people are gonna feel threatened by it. But the Baha'i role, the Baha'i strategy is entirely non-adversarial. Construction, attraction, and gradual attrition. So that's one way that one could try and answer your question. It's a, it's a very good question though, and there's much more that needs to be said and explored, actually, about how that works. But that's maybe the simplest way I've come to try and answer it. Thank you very much. <coughs> yes, uh, Dr. Mahmoud. If I may just follow up on that, uh, because you mentioned sociologists and I'm, you know, Sociologist. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm, uh, there isn't that the fact, I mean, I don't think Michael is assuming, or any of us, that there is an internal conflict either in the Baha'i faith or in the Baha'i community, because I, I think to be a human and to try to get through this life, there has to be conflict. I mean, there is no way that one can um, bypass that reality of life. And so there are times and ongoing uh, issues in the Baha'i community within now. I'm not, I mean, I'm not talking without, uh, where conflict does arise. But again, in the system, there are approaches on how to deal with that and how to approach it. And I believe you touch on this in the paper in terms of people who don't uh, adhere to the covenant. There's There are sanctions. There are laws and principles that we have to abide by, and if we don't internally, there are consequences. So it is a social change that's both within and without, and I would like to say that it, the, the, the challenging part in many instances is from within, because it requires such a mind change and a new set of norms, if you will, and those norms are ones that excellent question. It's an excellent question. And, you know, ultimately, ultimately it's a question of faith. Baha'is are confident that it can. But that's a, you know, it's a, that's a, a view rooted in faith. 
It's a view rooted in who we understand Baha'u'llah was and the authority of his voice, so to speak. Um, but we don't expect other people to accept that view. I mean, it can only be arrived at through a process of, of, of personal investigation and reflection and search on who Baha'u'llah was and what this community is and, and what are its uh, prospects for assuming you know, the functions of state. So I would say another way of thinking about it is you know, Baha'u'llah has given us a hypothesis and told us to test it. He said, we know that existing institutions are not adequate to the challenges, at least I tend to believe. I think that's, a, that's an easy conclusion many of us arrive at because we see the dysfunction the, you know, in the world, the injustices in the world around us. So let's assume we know that existing systems don't work that well. Here's a hypothesis to test. Will this system work? That's what Baha'is are doing. We're testing a hypothesis. It's on a vast scale, right? And, and it works. Uh, what's that? And it works. Well, so far, my experience, I have a lot of confidence in it. Now, and that's, I can also acknowledge what Hoda said, that it's not easy. And I hope I haven't presented a kind of rose-colored view. The Baha'i community is a difficult place to be. <laughs> not difficult because it's structured to be difficult. Difficult because we're all learning and struggling. How, what does unity and interdependence look like in a diverse community, right? So I would say, wait and see. <laughs> now, unfortunately, the outcome of this experiment, you know, it probably won't be in any of our lifetimes. So we're contributing to, you could say, a scientific experiment that, that our distant ancestors will, will find the results of. I think the good news is, though, that if the experiment turns out not to work, just to, to assume the kind of position of a skeptic for the moment, that it can be abandoned at any time. Because it only works as long as it's voluntarily embraced. So there's an there's a escape route <laughs> for humanity, if you want to think of it that way. I don't know who's next. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm studying elites. Elites uh, in the Middle East. Uh -huh. It's, of course, fascinating because, in a way, it's, it's breaking uh, uh, make us uh, iron law of oligarchy. Mm -hmm. It's hard to think. As I understand it, you, you uh, maybe could elaborate about this. There is no elites in Baha'i. Uh, You'll need to translate elites. 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 Oh, elites. elites. I'm sorry. Elites. I just didn't hear the okay. accent. OK, elites. Most of us. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and maybe uh, this is one question. I will try it if, 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 if there is. And maybe you can elaborate on, about the, the change, uh, and it's critical for this question, from Shubi Hendi to the House of Justice. This transition. Maybe how it uh, happened, in what way, uh, <coughs> maybe it can, it can assume this. Okay. Well, let me, I'll, I'll try and address some aspects of those questions very briefly. Now, the question of are there elites in the Baha'i community, of course, depends on how we define the elites. <laughs> there is rank in the Baha'i community. I mean, Baha'u'llah, ultimately, we consider a manifestation of God. And Abdu'l-Baha, we consider a very unique, unique individual in history, the kind of mystery of God, this perfect example of what it means to be human for Baha'is. Shoghi Effendi was the guardian of the Baha'i faith for this period, and that was a very high rank, so to speak. And today, you know, we and have hands of the cause. Hands of, uh, hands of the cause. We have uh, counselor members, and we have Universal House of Justice members. All of which, 
I would say receive a degree of respect based on their rank, which in itself is rooted in their service, right, rather than their ambition. But that respect is different than the sort of privilege that we, th we associate often with the term elites. So the power and privilege. Power. So, you know, when Mills writes about the power elite, <laughs> that's not present in the Baha'i faith at all, in any form. So there's rank, there's respect, there's a, a degree of sort of reverence and deference even to, to individuals who have, who have sort of served in great ways, served the cause. But it's very different. There's no material benefits associated with that at all. Actually more duties. Just more, yeah, more sacrifice, yeah. really. You know, when I was here as a gardener, I, I was here 20 years ago, I worked as a gardener in these beautiful gardens on Mount Carmel for two years. And I came here as a volunteer. I was provided room and board, a modest living allowance, and uh, really that's it. Well, members of the House of Justice that are elected to this institution, all of whom have fascinating careers in interesting fields, doctors, professors, uh, you know, all the real estate you know, people, all sorts of people that have been elected to this institution. Through no ambition of their own, they're tapped on the shoulder, told to serve on a house of justice, asked to relocate their whole life, their whole family in another country in the middle of a war zone, <laughs> right? Uh, give up their careers, and they serve under the same conditions that I served under as a gardener, in effect. They're given room and board, a modest living allowance, you know. And so it's not a power lead in that sense. So maybe that answers part of your, your first question. The second question about the transition from the guardian to the universal House of justice. That's a, uh, a huge, interesting historical topic that I can only say uh, there was a, you know, there was a time, maybe of what's most interesting, there was a time from when the Guardian passed away from, in 1957 to when the House of Justice was elected in 1963, in which there was no center of authority. This covenantal line was interrupted briefly. It was a moment in which the Baha'i faith could easily have flown apart, fragmented into different sects or schisms. Right? Because that's what the covenant prevents, among other things. But the institution of the hands of the cause actually served as the sort of chief stewards of the Baha'i faith during that period. And all the Baha'i community, because of the reverence and respect they showed to the, the hands of the cause, they rallied around the hands of the cause and uh, continued to essentially carry out the plans of action they were engaged with when the Guardian passed away, which culminated in their ability to elect the House of Justice in 1963. And with that election then, the sort of covenantal protection was reestablished, and it's permanent. And it's also, just historically, it's also of a very different nature, of course, now, rather than an individual, uh, you know, uh, appointed source of authority. It's now this elected institution. So it's of a very different nature, and it serves slightly different functions, but ultimately it protects and preserves the faith in the same way. So maybe I answered a little of your question.
is the belief in the covenant and the adherence to the covenant. This is what holds this kind of fluid system of no of, uh, of no rallying and uh, election without uh, candidates and without mm -hmm. the system and without those and the people wanting to be elected. Uh, it's this belief in the covenant and it's like a condition to, to maintain this. Yep. So when you talk about the transference to the secular world, to the entire world, whoever, whoever is willing to be influenced by the Baha'i method and adopt it, uh, does it, do they have also to, must they also adopt uh, the adherence to the covenant as, as a condition to maintain such a system mm -hmm. or a likewise system in the political world? So basically the question is, will this utopian uh, hope that you have for the future of humanity uh, consist of the world becoming Baha'i or running their political institutions, not only influenced by the Baha'i experiment, but believing in Baha'u'llah as a covenant giver, or not? It's an excellent question. And you know, if you weren't asking these specific questions, I'd say you're all asleep, because these are the right questions you should be asking. Very important questions. I can, again, I can give my sort of general understanding and invite you to study this further. Shoghi Effendi described kind of in broad brush strokes what Baha'is understand to be, you see, maybe the, the, the future direction. That, and we're talking about now maybe a period of a thousand years, not a lifetime even. But that if this Baha'i game proves itself, to use that earlier metaphor, right? And more and more people become attracted to it. <laughs> and you have to keep in mind, this is against the backdrop of a world that, in a Baha'i view at least, is disintegrating. I mean, it's collapsing. We have, from terrorism and war and the international drug trade and you know environmental crises we're facing and mass migrations of refugees, and I could go on and on and on, short scarcity of water and land and so forth, you know, Baha'is believe that humanity will no longer have the luxury of playing the old games. The stakes will get too high and, and old systems will fail too completely. And so in that context, again, nobody has to believe this. For Baha'is, this is just an article of our faith, the way we see things. Over time, Baha'is see that gradually more and more people will opt into this game, opt into the Baha'i community. And that, you know, at some point, somewhere, you'll have an entire country where the vast majority of people may become Baha'i. And then you might have another country somewhere else where the same thing happens. There may be a handful of countries like that. They're a purely voluntary process over many, many generations. If that time comes, then you're going to have a situation where the Baha'i institutions are functioning side by side with the state institutions around it, right? And you will also come to a time eventually, if Shoghi Effendi sort of alludes to, where at some point the overwhelming majority of the people of a given state will decide we're better off with the Baha'i institutions. They'll serve our interests better. It's quite possible even people who haven't embraced the covenant, that aren't Baha'i, will arrive at that conclusion. Again, that's speculation. So, in theory then, you have potentially in the future, in some states, a transition from systems of government we have right now toward the Baha'i administration that's purely voluntary, based on the overwhelming majority of the citizens of the country wanting it. And over time, if you have more and more countries doing that, what you have emerging really is a Baha'i world commonwealth. The early states in this Baha'i commonwealth. And potentially one day maybe all the states are part of that. Now, it still leaves the question, well maybe what about even a small minority of people in that context that reject the covenant and the faith? What will happen to them? And you know, how can this system exist as long as there's even one person who doesn't want to be part of it? I can't say exactly what the answer to that question is. The House of Justice will have to decide in time, when, if and when these you know, circumstances arrive, 
exactly how to deal with that situation, those minorities. What I can say is, everywhere on our faith, the fundamental principle actually is to give preference to the minority. So for instance, on a, in a Baha'i election, if there's a tie for the ninth place, the same number of ballots cast between two different people, if one of those belongs to a minority group within the Baha'i community, they automatically receive that, you know, that seat. Because we believe so strongly in diversity and, and, and in the rights of minorities and protection of minorities. So I have faith, personally as a Baha'i, that if and when this scenario unfolds, the Universal House of Justice will go to extreme measures to protect and, and uphold the rights of, of any small minorities that still are outside the game by their own choice. But I can't tell you, you know, any more detail than that. And again, some people might be quite alarmed by the whole prospect. It's an alarming vision if you're outside and don't believe. Uh, so I can only reassure you, you know, again, with the, the sort of voluntary nature of this, but I can't answer your question in any more detail than that. It's a very good question. Can we take another question? Because as you know, this is a time of fasting for our Baha'i friends, and I'm sure they are eager to go and uh, Eat break their uh, fast. So I think you had a question? Yeah. Yes, please. In what way also? Well, I don't know much about the Baha'i uh, religion. That's good first. company. You're in good company. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also uh, am a psychologist and I'm the dean of the faculty of education here. Mm. My name is Oprah Meisner. And I'm very interested in spiritual development, mm -hmm. studying spiritual development, including the Baha'i way, which is presented very nicely. Um, Basically, um, first what I wanted to know, and that's why I said that I'm just, you know, a very lay person in this area. How many Baha'i people, how many people adhere to the Baha'i religion, Baha'i way of life, as far as you know? There are about five million people in the world today. Okay. In virtually every country of the world, from over 2,000 different, you know, ethnic and national and religious backgrounds. And the other thing also is, is really informative. So we maybe mm, it's known please. to everybody here. Uh, what are the kinds of issues that the Baha'i institutions deal with or make decisions about? So if they don't decide, you know, how much money you gain, you know, you so besides tapping on the shoulder and letting you know that come to this beautiful city of Haifa and mm -hmm. stay here and learn Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> so besides this, so what are the kinds of issues in which the institutions deal with or have power on? Sure, good question. On the latter one, they are still working. <laughs> 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 ah, no. You haven't learned Hebrew for two years here? No, I don't know him no, particularly. No, no, I was, it was in the 80s that I was here working as a gardener. But and you didn't no, learn Hebrew at that time? I'm afraid to say I didn't pick up much Hebrew. <laughs> At that time, people didn't, didn't study Hebrew at this time. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. So your question also is very good. And, you know, so at the, the simplest, at the local level in the smallest communities, you know, the decisions often have to do with not much more than who's bringing refreshments to our monthly meeting and you know, simple things like this. Well, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, that's not the purpose. On a voluntary basis. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, in local communities that are uh, of a larger size and, and you know, increasing capacity, Baha'is are engaged in many things, uh, from the management of properties on the one hand to uh, outward-looking social and economic development projects that, you know, that they're pursuing in order to increase the, uh, the prosperity and well-being of, of the people around them. So some of the most advanced communities for instance, in Iran, in the early part of the 20th century, where, where you saw some of the most advanced, largest Baha'i communities, Baha'is were creating schools, the first schools for girls 
in the country were created by Baha'is. And of course, they were not only open to Baha'is, but they were open to everyone. And they generated, uh, you know, in, in many ways, educated the first generation of professional women in Iran. So those would have been local assemblies that would have been involved with those sorts of processes. So that's, you know, our, our more sophisticated local communities are engaged in increasingly complex processes like that. At the national level, well, I mean, it ranges, you know, again, social and economic development processes, community growth and expansion, publishing trusts, the management of properties and funds, well, you know, a whole range of, of functions of that nature. I'm sure I could think of more, but it gives you a sense. At the international level, of course, the Universal House of Justice really has the entire Baha'i world in its hands and, and, and is guiding the development, the expansion, the training, the management of properties, the sort of uh, expansion of, of outward looking processes, social and economic development processes, interactions with you know on diplomatic levels with institutions from the State of Israel to the United Nations, uh, the defense of the Baha'is in countries where they're being persecuted, like Iran and Egypt right now. So I know a, a whole range of those sorts of things. In addition, actually, to uh, um, you know, effort, efforts to alleviate suffering outside the Baha'i community when natural disasters occur and other things that when, where Baha'is can lend support. So that's kind of a snapshot, maybe, at this moment in time of some of the things. Yeah, so in, uh, in some countries, Baha'i communities, you know, have sort of full responsibility for a lot of, you know, personal, personal things related to marriage and divorce and other things like that. Uh, yeah. Resolving personal conflicts in the communities, other, other things yeah, like many, that. Probably all the fields except probably yeah. having a military yeah. and, you know, all, all these uh, issues actually, you know, all, all, everything. Well, you don't know where we keep our military. <laughs> I do. Want, I will point out, actually, though, that what I've said earlier could easily be mistaken. Baha'is are not pacifists. Baha'is also, despite this whole process of change I've described, Baha'is recognize that there is and can be a role for military action under certain circumstances in the world. We're not strict pacifists. We do believe, for instance, in the principle of collective security, where if na other nations aggress against one nation, all of the nations in the world should rise up to defeat that aggressor. And in the various other contexts. So I don't, I don't also want to misguide you into thinking that, that you know, we're so strictly pacifist in that way. And maybe the last comment that I want to offer, just in response to what I think might be some of your interests, that I really haven't touched on, this whole system only works when attention is also paid to the development of the individual within it, that's as you're well aware. That's the most important. Yeah. So, you know, the, the Baha'i system of governance I've just described, in all honesty, even for most Baha'is, that's the furthest thing from their mind. If they're not elected to an institution, they're not engaged, then at this moment in time especially, they're not paying attention and, and all that interested even often. What all the highs are striving to do is develop themselves individually through various spiritual disciplines like prayer and daily meditation and the fast that, you know, period we're going through right now. And, uh, to educate our children and train them in moral ways through, through various, you know, experimenting with educational processes, socialization processes within the community. We're, we're, we're now building a worldwide training institute to also uh, train Baha'is in specific skills, you know, beyond, in addition to sort of qualities and attributes and attitudes and to develop certain skills. skills. Well, right now those skills have more to do with, you know, well, skills within the Baha'i community, the things that the community needs to function. So how to teach a children's class Education. that helps, it, you know, the moral development of our children. How to lead a junior youth group, a, a, you know, a group for teenagers that helps you know, keep them off of the, the insanity that, that's 
pulling them in, you know, these sorts of things. So there's tremendous attention given to the development of the spiritual, the individual life. And, and in this sense, the Baha'i administrative order is also, though, uh, a school, I mean, an, an educational context, because we try and develop ourselves individually, as imperfect as we all are, and believe me, Baha'is are not you know, the most perfect individuals you'll find. We're just normal human beings. We're striving to develop ourselves individually. When we're elected to these institutions or serving in various institutions, then you could say those individual qualities are tested at an even higher degree. And we're forced to try and refine them more. And so we learn by doing. And, and there's a, it's a very important dimension that I haven't discussed today that I don't even discuss much in this paper because you know, many other people have discussed that and it tends to be more familiar actually to Baha'is and, and other observers. Well, thank you very much for the both for the lecture <laughs> and for the deep uh, thorough answers. And uh, we meet again here on the 3rd of June which uh, Dr. Uh, Heshmat Muayyad from the University of Chicago is going to talk about uh, Baha'i Persian poets and poetry. Mm. So, thank you very much again. You're welcome. Thank you, thank thank you, you for coming. Thank you.